I mean, I can kick this one off because um, I've seen some stuff. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, the world, the landscape is shifting really, really fast, especially because of the cloud. And, um, you know, coming from a very large enterprise in my last job where networking was a pretty big portion of it, uh, transition to the cloud became more and more and more important. And this is one of the things that I admire about uh, certification exams that like Cisco and Juniper offers, that they have broken it down based on the types of places that you would do networking. So you've traditionally got things like enterprise, data center, and service provider. And where I'm seeing things get shaken up the most is in the enterprise space. Take a look at Microsoft, for example. Microsoft, three years ago, really rolled the dice on the cloud a little bit when they destroyed the MCSA certification. They said, There's just, we're just not going to test you on Windows Server anymore. Um, and we're just going to force everybody to learn the cloud. So I think the big challenge with that then was they had so much backlash about it that Microsoft ended up rolling out a hybrid certification exam. It's actually their biggest exam they offer now. So most people who are in the enterprise today are being forced to shift towards hybrid technologies. So if your realm of expertise wants to go towards enterprise, you're going to have to learn, yeah, you're going to have to learn some of the traditional enterprise concepts, but you're also going to have to learn hybrid networking and like bridging into the cloud, which is a really tricky and interesting space to be in. The flip side of that is data centers really run the cloud today and the cloud is dominant. So data centers aren't going anywhere and service providers link clouds together. So it's kind of like you want to pick your track and understand what you're going into with those tracks. Um, for me, just personally, this is just speaking anecdotally and personally, uh, I'm particularly interested in data center because of how they support the cloud and how they actually make the cloud work. Well, I want to add to that by saying that, yes, there is a big shift across the, all of the domains that Docs just mentioned, enterprise, carrier, and SP, and uh, data center, mainly because you know, as a service provider, for example, you have to understand your customer, you have to understand what their requirements are, what their needs are, and then design, you know, your carrier edge and your core to support that. And particularly for a data center, you have to understand what infrastructure you need to be able to you know, support all of those cloud operations. But I want to make one thing really clear and add on to what Knox said, which is that even with the cloud coming around and having to understand how you can, you know, build your networking designs and infrastructure to fit into that cloud model, OSPF is OSPF, BGP is BGP, IPsec is IPsec, right? And so even when you start, you know, transitioning into a hybrid, you know, model where you have the on-prem and the cloud design, you're still using a lot of the same technologies that we've been using for the same, you know, for the past 20 years. IPsec has been around for a really long time. So, you know, it's all about understanding how to, you know, the new way, the, the new kitchen mixer machine. But at the end of the day, you're still baking a cake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. BGP and IPsec are critical in the enterprise Absolutely. these days. I would um, I would take a slightly different uh, spin, I suppose, on it because we can get into the technical. But in my experience, when I look back over my career and we're talking, I mean, the question is really how do I secure a long-term career in networking? It's almost not about a technology at that point, right? Because I know when I was hired, it was to hang access points on the ceiling. And so I learned how wireless worked. And eventually, I needed to connect those access points back. So I learned routing and switching. And that eventually took me into data center. But each transition was a mix of my desires and the, you know, what I was attracted to from a technology perspective, but also opportunity and recognizing that we are all given out different opportunities. And every now and again, I do get asked by somebody, how do I get into data center networking? Well, you can study it. But you do also have to have the opportunity to use it. And it can come in, you know, you can, you can really try to brute force it and say, okay, I'm going to go get all the certifications and go try to get a job that allows me to use that. And that path works. But it's really not about the technology again. It's about what is my mindset around evolving? I have to be ready to evolve, whether it's to the cloud, which is absolutely a huge thing. And every engineer needs to at least be comfortable with cloud concepts and understanding those kinds of things, but not never, every network engineer is going to see that, well, you know, cloud is an integral part of my day to day. And so as long as you're having the attitude of this is kind of what I like, but I'm not going to, you know, build a wall around it. You know, the classic example is the old telephony PBX guys, 
I know that I was around some of those. They're like, you know, I'm not going to learn that fancy voice over IP technology because PBXs have been around forever, so they will be around forever. Yeah. And they saw themselves out of the building eventually. And so as long as you're not doing that, as long as you're open not only to, again, looking for what comes next, finding some level of contentment with who you are and where you are, but also looking for those opportunities, that's what will keep you going in the long run. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything. I, uh, You know, when I first started off in my education, I was in sales. That's how I started off at 19, 20 years old in sales. And I was getting my, my lunch handed to me. I was broke, broke for a long time. So I went to school. I got a loan. It's back in the 80s. Where you were not even a concept yet. Um, and I got this huge loan, and I learned how to do color uh, read resistors. Now, talk about a skill I've never used, right? Uh, how to determine the value of a resistor and all that stuff. I went to school for eight months for a year course. They, I, I got pulled out early, got hired by EDS because they just liked, like the energy because I was enthusiastic, like, hungry. And then I started working in stuff that I had no idea. Like, I didn't know what networks were back in those days. I mean, the token ring stuff it was new. Uh, and then, it, like you mentioned, I just learned where I was at. It's like, okay, they have this technology. That guy looks like he knows what he's doing. And he works on these cool networks. He has a silver briefcase. I want to do that. And then I would befriend them and say, honestly, what do you do what you do and how did you get there? And then just keep studying. Yeah. And so um, I think the secret of getting the perfect job in IT is to be willing to embrace the current technology, whatever it is. And so, you know, for me, I've never had to change how I've learned, right? I'm always just learning the same old things. Over. I have to change myself probably every 18 months. I ever kick in the pants, like we have this trainer group uh, for you who are watching. <laughs> we have this trainer group we get together every year. And uh, it's a kick in the pants for me because I've got people like, well, like everybody except for me who is like just crushing it. And I'm like, okay, it's time to step up. And that's the key. Just continue to step up. And like, should I learn this technology or that technology? My, my answer would be, which one is within your reach? Like what you mentioned, which one is used at your company or which one are you more likely to do? Because if you memorize something and learn it, even to do some hands-on, it's going to evaporate over time. And, so. and I want to, you know, combine both of what you guys just said, which is you have to have an application for what you're learning. Yeah. You know, it, it's, you know, I get this as a networking conversation. I'm going to bring in code here for a moment, right? I see questions all the time going, well, how do I learn Python? I want to learn, you know, bring it back to networking, network automation. And the answer is you have to have an application for it. Yes. You, know, yes. you, you can learn, you know, going back to networking again, you can learn VXLAN, you can learn BHP all you want, but you mm -hmm. also have to have to have the context, have the opportunity, like Jeff mentioned, um, to see how it's actually applied mm -hmm. uh, in order for that knowledge to be useful. Yeah. And that's when it actually gets into business politics at that point. If you're seeing a solution that you want to implement in your enterprise, your data center, your ISP, you're going to have to be able to sell it, you know, to your boss it. to get the permission yeah. to do it. Yeah. So, you know, there's going to be a little bit of like, okay, well, I've learned this thing. Now I want to apply it. I think we could benefit from it. How can I convince my boss to let me do it? That's another. And I'm communication, involved. interpersonal skills, those are awesome. And, and does it fit? Because, again, how do I learn Python? Well, do you need to learn Python? Yeah. Like for your day-to-day, -day, for your today job? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to become a Python engineer. I want to... You know, there's such a fear of missing out in this industry that I've really seen, especially over the last five to 10 years, as far as, boy, if I don't learn cloud today, I'm going to be left behind. If I don't learn Python mm -hmm. and automation today, I'm going to be left behind. Those are great skills, and you can have a fantastic career around those skills. But also, if you're working for a shop that you've got, you know, 10 network switches, you don't need automation there. Yeah. And so that comes back to that question of, well, how do I get there? Well, you either have to look for an opportunity or you have to go get certified in the meantime and create those opportunities. But also don't feel like you're just going to immediately be left behind if you don't learn all of the newest, shiniest technologies. Because I promise you, you'll never learn them all. And there's going to be a bunch of them that you could try to learn. And because you don't have the opportunities and because you're not using those technologies, it really would have been better for you. You know, Kelvin, you said it earlier, right? All these new technologies are built on the same technologies. SD-WAN is still built on IPsec. all the same yeah. old you technologies. Go. Yeah. You've got to be learning what is applicable to you and also is going to take you in the general direction of where you want to go. And on the point of FOMO, a good friend of mine actually phrases it, phrases it this way, you know, the IT industry as a whole, not just networking, but as a whole, is generally speaking a walk. Now, you know, depending on what... What do you mean a walk? Like it, it's not a run. You don't have to. You, it's, it, oh, you don't, I see. Pace wise. Yeah, pace wise. Yes, yeah. it, it's a, it's a walk. marathon. Yeah. yeah, it. Yeah, it's a marathon. Not you know. Uh, what's the phrase? Marathon. Sprint. Not a sprint. There you go. <laughs> Couldn't remember that word. Um, all the agile folks are gonna be mad at me. Anyway, um, the point is right. Like, it people are 
always so scared, like you said, of missing out on the new shiny new great thing. And I'm going, well, it to Knox's point, not every business is not uh, most businesses are are not going to pick that up immediately, mm-hmm. right? Because there has to be a business justification, and that doesn't come overnight, um, in most cases anyway. And so it, it it's more of a walk. As long as you don't stay still, as long as you keep being hungry, like you said, continue to learn you're not going to get left behind. You don't have to be Usain Bolt in order to catch up in this industry. I have a friend who uh, worked with at Paramount Pictures way back in the day, and he looked me up like 10 years later on social media and said, hey, how did you get to become a double CCI? I thought, one day at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I did. Every day I studied a little bit and pushed myself forward, and that's really the secret. It's a a marathon, not not a sprint. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, Jeff, one time you said something that I thought was really prudent too, where you were talking about uh, you learn this great new technology and then you don't really have a use case for it in enterprise right now. So all of a sudden you have this solution and you start looking for a problem and that's how you break stuff. Um, I, at the flip side of that that I'll say is it's perfect to learn a new technology and then wait for that problem to come to you because it will eventually. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why these technologies exist. It was to solve a problem. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's also a really good thing about getting FOMO and not trying to rush out there and pitch it up to your boss because, uh, you know, you'll you'll mess. I, one, of the worst, ugh, one of the worst mess ups I ever had was years ago when I was in IT consulting, I learned I was going for my MCSE at the time and I learned DFS replication. That's where a file share replicates to another file share. And I uh, I was like, we can implement this to help migrate an old file share to a brand new server, a brand new file share. And I just I thought it was such a great solution as opposed to just using good old fashioned Robocopy. And I, I broke their whole file share. There was data loss. It was just it was just a disaster. So yeah, don't don't. But it would have been cool though. It would have been so cool. <laughs> I, I feel you. But and let me tell you, I learned a lot about DFS through that <laughs> through that solution. <laughs> All right. So I have um, a significant amount of my career has been involved with data center networking, and it's been a fascinating trend, especially from the perspective that I was also in sales as a pre-sales engineer for a time, and going into places trying to sell data center solutions as people were migrating to the cloud, there was always this fear in the back of our minds, um, us being the people trying to sell Cisco data center solutions, for example, that everyone's going to go to the cloud, no one's going to buy servers anymore, Cisco just started selling servers and now everyone's going to the cloud. But really looking back and seeing what, at least in my experience, what I have seen is that cloud is overall a more expensive solution. Uh, you That comes with a ton of benefits. And there are absolutely applications that belong in the cloud. But when you run your cost analysis, a lot of companies don't have that down. You know, the science isn't exact. I think it's going to cost me this much money, but until I put everything in the cloud, I don't find out until later. And so what I've seen a lot of companies do is push everything to the cloud or most of their workloads to the cloud, realize, oh my goodness, this is way more expensive than I thought. And there's this washback effect where it's, okay, we're going to pull some of that back out. Mm-hmm. And so what I see as where we've hit this period of stability and a little bit more of, I think, what we're going to see moving forward is this hybrid cloud or multi-cloud concept where I'm going to not just push everything to AWS or Azure or name your cloud. It's I'm going to have some workloads that belong in AWS, in AWS, some in Azure that belong in Azure, and some in my private cloud that belong in my private cloud. And this is the multi-cloud world that we hear talked about so much and so to really come back to data center engineering, I mean, maybe if there was no cloud, would organizations have more data center infrastructure? Sure. But with the cloud there, most organizations aren't going to be giving up their private data centers. So if you're a data center engineer, Val, absolutely. I mean, the storage market is out of control right now. The mm-hmm. server market, nothing has slowed down. Mm-hmm. If you want to learn servers, you want to learn storage, you want to learn data center networking, you're going to have a long and successful career because it's not just going away. And I want to bring up uh, that private cloud uh, concept that you talked about there. 
you know, when we talk about cloud, we think about, you know, the three big players, AWS, you know, Azure, and uh, GCP. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think about Oracle Cloud. Sometimes there are some, there are some other cloud providers. But we usually think about public cloud, the clouds yeah. where, mm -hmm. you know, you and I can go sign up and use their services. But a lot of what we don't think about sometimes is that our data centers, our on-premise data centers, are clouds on their own. We can run services. We can run workloads. And getting back to that multi-cloud point, that is a really great usage of the data center having basically this, you know, what I call a charcuterie board approach where you can just pick and choose what you need to. Oh, my, you know, I, there are some, you know, there's, uh, there's a collection of data where, you know, keeping it in check with certain government regulations means I need to keep it on prem. I, I, I want to ship that off. Yes. Regulations. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And having that storage on prem, you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to say, because I don't want to get burned here, I don't want to say that on-prem data center is never going away, but it certainly isn't today. I'll say it. It's, <laughs> never, going away. it's, yeah. never, it's never going away. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said here. I think that um, the hybrid environment is where it's going to stay for a while for exactly the reasons it's been laid out. I'll tell you right now, if you're seriously exploring the cloud, you should go into it thinking virtual machines are your last option. You don't want to use the cloud for virtual machines. You want to use it for platform. And that's where you see the infinite scalability at micro pennies of a cost. And I don't think most people know that. That's why they lift and shift their on-premises virtual machines into the cloud, thinking it's going to save them money, and it ends up blowing their bill through the water. And then they migrate it back. Ultimately, I think the ultimate solution is a hybrid infrastructure where your core infrastructure is on-premises, your Active Directory, your file share systems, your authentication should be in there, and that should be in your data center that you manage and own and run. And your application needs to be re-architected to take advantage of the next generation platform services to run in Azure and AWS. So yeah, hybrid is absolutely the way to go when it comes to all of that. And make no mistake, too, when we're talking about on-prem data, there is a difference between on-prem data center and oh, wow. private yeah. cloud. The concept of private cloud is really, well, no, specifically because a lot of people will refer to, oh, I've got servers and a, a storage array. That's my private cloud. Mm. No, it's not. Yeah. Because the definition of a cloud is to, what, have, for example, self-service operations. Mm -hmm. Can your developers go out and spin up a platform, a uh, you know, a, a virtual machine, for example, can they do that without calling up IT and asking them to log into, you know, your, your console and doing it? And so can you deliver all of these things? Can you deliver, you know, per department billing based on mm -hmm. these kinds of things? And so this is where the multi-cloud concept is, becomes really cemented because if your developers can go out and say, you know what, for this workload, I'm going to put it out into, you know, maybe my private cloud for this one, maybe my, um, my AWS for this one, right? And now that you've got all the choices, you see the billing options, you understand, you know, those kinds of concepts. Now you're really embracing this multi-cloud world. And at that point, the cloud on premise, it all gets along. Mm -hmm. And, and so there isn't really this concept of it is the data center go away. No, because it's part of my multi-cloud world, mm -hmm. which is just where we're going to be. Yeah. And it makes perfect and, sense. It's the perfect design. Yes, it really is. And you see a lot. And it's one last thing I wanted to mention here. You know, the, what we're saying here about multi-cloud becoming extremely prevalent, that's not just us, you know, speaking in this room here, preaching off of our soapbox here. Vendors, VMware, Dell, you know, you, you see your uh, Cisco, VMware, and name any data center vendor you want, NetApp. Mm -hmm. They are going in that direction. You know, VMware has things like vRealize that allows you to tie all of your multi-cloud up in a nice little box, wrap a little mm -hmm. ribbon on it and call it a day. You know, you've got things like hyper-converged infrastructure that really help mm -hmm. with that design yep. and that deployment, that, you know, management. So the, 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 the designs are definitely out there, you know, in deployment in full force right now today. Hey, thanks for watching and subscribe right here to get the latest information from CBT Nuggets. And if you're new to or considering a career in the world of IT, head on over to CBT Nuggets and sign up for a free trial.